As you know, the heat in solids is carried by elastic waves whose quanta are called phonons. It was postulated over 40 years ago that such phonons can collide with one another in what is called a normal process. In such a process, two phonons collide and form a third phonon, or vice versa. In this collision, the total momentum of the phonons is conserved, which means that the collision is similar to that of two billiard balls. Let me demonstrate such a collision with two coins. As they collide, one comes to rest, and the other one carries away all the momentum. I think you could see how this one came to rest, and this one kept on flying. In the language of phonons, one would say two phonons were annihilated, and a third phonon was created, the third one carrying all the combined momentum. In addition to such normal processes, it was also predicted that umklapp processes or momentum-destroying processes should occur among phonons. The momentum of the resultant phonon is different from that of the two incoming ones. Umklapp processes should become dominant at higher temperatures and should give rise to such phenomena as the slow diffusion of heat or thermal resistivity. The existence of Umklapp processes, therefore, has been demonstrated by a variety of measurements involving the diffusion of heat or thermal resistivity. Normal processes, on the other hand, do not slow down the propagation of heat because they conserve the momentum. For their demonstration, we have to study a different phenomenon, namely second sound in solids. And it is the purpose of this videotape to show you this phenomenon. For the experiment, we have to propagate heat pulses through a crystal. A crystal has thin metal films evaporated on two opposing faces. A short current pulse heats up the left metal film, and the heat pulse enters the solid. After a certain time, the heat will arrive at the other metal film, whose resistance varies with temperature. This bolometer acts as a detector of the heat. The crystal is mounted in a cryostat. You can see the crystal here, and you can see one metal film on this face. The entire cryostat, then, is cooled to low temperatures. And next, Mr. Tom McNally, who has done the entire experiment, will show you the assembled equipment. The sample chamber has been mounted in these doors and cooled to 4 degrees Kelvin. We put heat into the sample with current pulses from this pulser, and then we detect the temperature variations at the other end and amplify them with this equipment here. And finally, we display the results here on the oscilloscope. What you see on the oscilloscope screen is the temperature rise of the bolometer as a function of the time elapsed since the heater pulse. In the course of the experiment, the average temperature of the entire sample increases, and this will affect the shape of the trace. You will see this in the following movie, which was photographed directly off the oscilloscope screen. There will be one sudden change of gain during the movie. Here is the trace. Watch the change of gain, and now see how the shape of the heat pulse changes as the average sample temperature rises. The temperature range is from 10 to 20 degree Kelvin. The movie probably went a little too fast, so we will show it again. But before doing this, let me first show you, show you a graph that was drawn from the original oscilloscope traces at low temperatures and at high temperatures. 
At 8 degree Kelvin, the phonons move ballistically from the heater to bolometer, that is, without scattering and with their speed, with, which is the speed of sound. You recognize the faster longitudinal and the slower transverse pulse. That is at 8 degree Kelvin. At 19 degree Kelvin, that is approximately twice the temperature, the ballistic signal has almost completely vanished. And instead, a typical diffusion profile is observed, which is delayed rapidly as the temperature increases. Note the rise here at 22 degree Kelvin. This is the temperature region in which the momentum destroying umklapp processes dominate the energy transport. The phonons migrate with a random walk from the hot to the cold end of the crystal. Let's try to identify the ballistic and the diffusive temperature regimes in the movie. Now here you see the ballistic signals, they decrease in intensity with increasing temperature, change in gain. See how the pulse changes its shape completely as it now approaches the diffusive regime. Almost no ballistic signals are left. If you have looked carefully, you may have noticed a peculiar phenomenon occurring halfway through the movie. The ballistic transverse pulse appear to arrive at a later time. Again, a set of graphs may help to visualize this. At low temperature, you see ballistic heat propagation. And at high temperature, diffusive propagation. At intermediate temperatures, around 12 degree Kelvin, the ballistic signals become relatively weak. and a new pulse emerges out of the transverse signal. Even at the highest temperature, you can see the remnants of the ballistic pulses. The new pulse arrives at a later time than both the longitudinal and the transverse ballistic pulses. Hence, its speed is slower. This new pulse is the second sound. Now, what is second sound? I will try to explain this with the aid of a simple analogy using atoms in a gas. A single atom flies with its thermal velocity through an evacuated tube from left to right. Next, we fill the tube with many atoms, as shown here, and allow collisions among these atoms, which, as you know, conserve momentum. If we now increase the particle density on the left end of the tube, for instance, by tapping it, then you know what happens. This particle density pulse will also move to the right, but with the speed of sound. This speed is related, but not equal to, the thermal velocity of the atoms. The numerical factor is if the temperature is kept constant, 1 over the square root of 3. The origin of this factor is purely geometrical. It follows from the Pythagorean theorem. All you must do is to consider that, on the average, every atom will move with equal velocity components forward, upward, and sideways. You should think about this point. Now to the phonons. A single phonon flies ballistically through the crystal with its velocity. This corresponds to the low temperature case. As the temperature rises, more phonons will fill the crystal. And according to the theory, which I cited in the beginning of this videotape, they will collide with each other a normal process collision in which the momentum is conserved, exactly as if gas atoms collided. By analogy, then, we can write down immediately 
how fast a particle density pulse in the phonon gas will propagate. It will propagate more slowly than the phonons by a factor of one over the square root of three. Now, the phonons move with the speed of sound, and hence we call this collective excitation of phonons second sound. The second sound moves more slowly than both the longitudinal and the transverse phonons. This is what you've seen in the movie. As the temperature increases, the propagation of energy shifts from the ballistic mode to that of the second sound. Let us have another look at the movie now. This time, however, we want to concentrate on the intermediate temperature range. The ballistic pulses, as the temperature rises, the new pulse arises, you can see beautifully now the second sound peak and the two ballistic ones, and now the transition to the diffusive arrival. Diffusion. Another trace, ballistic signals, and as they become smaller, the transverse pulse sh shifts to the right. You now have almost exclusively second sound vestiges of the ballistic pulses. The second sound peak becomes smaller, and now it, the transition to the diffusion here, end of film. You may wonder why it took so long to discover second sound and with its help to study normal processes. The answer to this is a simple practical matter. In ordinary materials, phonons are scattered not only by other phonons, but also by lattice defects, foreign atoms and the like. These defects scatter phonons diffusively, like umklaut processes, and therefore they tend to mask the second sound. Hence the problem was, as so many times in solid state physics, a materials problem. We had to wait until nearly perfect crystals became available. What have we learned from these measurements? Two things. First, phonons can undergo momentum conserving normal process collision. And secondly, phonons can, in certain respects, behave just like atoms in a gas. In conclusion, I hope that this videotape has helped you to get a somewhat better feeling for this elusive particle, the phonon.